Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the furthest room at the, for the last session of the day. Uh, it's been a, a long day. Uh, we're going to talk today about transforming risk assessment by using open standards um, in data collaboration. So we've been working on the risk data library, uh, developing open standards for uh, metadata to describe risk information. And we've been working on this several years. We've now got some traction with some, uh, some users implementing the, the risk data library, and we wanted to share the, uh, the concept, the vision of the, of the risk data library with you, some of the details about how to use it, um, and share with you some, um, some use cases, examples where it's been used at the moment. And hopefully by the end, encourage you to also explore the RDL and use it in your own work as well. Um, so we've got uh, four of us in the room and a, and a recording from somebody uh, remotely. So we first have uh, P Pierre Chernovsky, and Pierre's a DRM specialist at GFDRR and runs the um, RDL program as part of the Digital Earth team at GFDRR. Um, online, we're going to have Rachel Vint, who's Director of Open Data Services, and they provided uh, all of the best practice in open data standards to bring the risk data library to the point it is today. So uh, Rachel will talk through some of the, the context of open standards and, and their importance beyond risk data, as well as for the, the risk data library. And then we have uh, Daniela Zuluaga from, uh, from Arup, who's a, uh, Daniela's a senior risk and resilience engineer, um, brings a lot of expertise in risk and resilience assess assessment um, and developing climate resilience strategies. So she'll talk ha about how Arup um, are using the RDL. And then Pradeep Mandapaka will talk uh, from the perspective of um, JBA risk management using the standards as well. So he's a technical director uh, bringing uh, hydrology, climate expertise into JBA's work on risk and resilience. Uh, my name's Stuart Fraser. Uh, I'm a senior DRM consultant at GFDRR. And I've been working on not only risk assessments, um, but also open standards and tools to share um, risk information more broadly for several years. So um, with that, I will um, just give you the agenda. So Pierre's going to take us through the vision for the risk data library, the background. I'll take you through some of the, the capabilities of the RDL standard. Um, and then we'll show uh, Rachel's video on, on the RDLS in, terms, in the context of open data standards more broadly. And then we'll, we'll have uh, Daniela and Pradeep demonstrating the value of RDLS in practice. So, Pierre, over to you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Pierre Chonesky. So, I'm a disaster management specialist at the World Bank, and I'm leading that project uh, so to, together with uh, Stu. So, thanks for coming. Uh, really, I consider you all uh, geeks uh, because <laughs> coming to a, a session on, on open data standard uh, at the end of a long day, I appreciate. Um, so I'm going to, to give you the, the why and the, the why uh, and the vision of um, the, the risk data library. So, uh, first of all, so we are part of um, GFDR, and as you, you might know, uh, the, the global facility for DSR reduction and recovery. We have been really, um, from the beginning, supporting the access to uh, risk information. That's really uh, always been a key uh, objective. Uh, alongside of supporting uh, capacities for, uh, for countries. Uh, so providing the, the possibility for anyone uh, to uh, access to his data um, was uh, one of our um, uh, key, um, key uh, objectives. And so it's really also aligned with, uh, of course, the Sendai framework that you uh, um, probably know about. Um, uh, and the fact that, yes, disaster risk management, disaster risk assessments should be based on an understanding of disaster risk in all its dimensions. And so when we say all the dimensions, we mean many different information we have to combine together, right? So uh, that's really uh, the beginning of our journey towards thinking about uh, the why uh, we should have data standards for disaster risk information. And so we are in kind of a statu quo in terms of uh, how we 
work on risk data. And that was funny, you know, I, I uh, uh, attended the, the session on Google speaking about uh, artificial intelligence, but the reality of our day-to-day -day life is uh, we are still emailing our colleagues, so hey, uh, where can I find that data set? Uh, I saw that report, and, uh, but I can't find the data behind it, so how, how do I do? And I'm sure that resonates in uh, all of uh, your, your uh, work. So that's really the situation where we are still in. So uh, an increase in terms of demand for risk information uh, because of also like uh, the mandate for uh, no uh, all investment, for instance, to uh, do a disaster risk screening and so on. But still, like uh, difficulty to find uh, that type of data. And often, if you are lucky and you find a data set, you, you don't have the right uh, description, you don't have the, the right way uh, um, to, to find about uh, what is in the, the content of that data set and also what was the process through which uh, we uh, came up with that type of information. So that's really um, what we have been trying to, uh, to address uh, with uh, the risk data library work. Um, and our vision is the following. So what if uh, I could easily find information? What if I could have um, tools that can uh, help me to search for, to uh, access, to share with uh, my colleagues, to share with other organizations uh, risk information? So that's really the driver for our, for our project and, uh, and hopefully something that will be uh, useful for, for you. Um, and so for that, and I mean also, uh, based on that, we um, uh, really think about um, the uh, open open models, right? And so, of course, there is the open data movement, and but much more we have what we call the FAIR, so it's about findable, accessible, interoperable, and re reusable uh, data. So that's coming from the scientific community, and it, that's really been uh, also an influence for us on how we should think about the way we uh, should uh, be able to, uh, to access risk information. And here is the result. So the risk data library, or uh, let's say the risk data library standard, is about describing the different key categories of information that uh, are needed for disaster risk assessment. So it's about uh, describing your exposure part, describing your hazard part, describing the vulnerability part that is linking uh, the two elements together, and then describing the, the risk um, output, so the loss, but also the damage uh, data, right? So that's really that, that vision that we want to promote, uh, but we are, of course, one organization, and we, for, for that standard to be adopted and for that vision to be achieved, we need to, to create uh, what we call that network effect, right? So we need a lot of organizations, we need a lot of early adopters to uh, come with us and to show that actually we can uh, share data, uh, risk information in a, in a better way. So I'm hoping that throughout that, that um, session, we, uh, you will have a better understanding of uh, what is a risk data library and maybe you will want to, uh, to test it. Thank you. Oh yeah, I, I forgot that slide, uh, <laughs> that we have many partners. Um, so we have a, a steering committee uh, with GEM Foundation, UCL AP Center, OASIS um, uh, Modeling Framework, uh, IDF of course, 33, GBA um, with uh, Pradeep in the room, IFRC, the, the Red Cross. And I, I should also acknowledge uh, the support from the 33 Foundation for the last part of the, the development that you are going to, uh, to see. So thanks again. Okay, so I'll just take you through some of the components of the RDLS. Um, we won't go into too much detail, there's, there's so much to cover, um, but there is lots of documentation on the website for you to explore each of these components in detail and, and get to grips with how to um, complete the metadata standard. Um, okay, so Pierre already mentioned the four components. Um, so within the vulnerability data, we provide capability to describe vulnerability curves, fragility curves, damage to loss models, um, engineering demand parameters, um, social vulnerability indexes. So. It allows you to describe lots of different data in terms of vulnerability. Um, exposure data, we focus on describing the asset category, buildings, forestry, livestock, etc. 
um, the taxonomy that's been used so people can immediately see what taxonomy has been used to describe the occupancy type, the, the construction type, or the, the asset type. And we provide the quantity description. So within the metadata, you can search for exposure data that's providing replacement cost or number of people or kilometers of road. So you can immediately search by that quantity. Within hazard data, we describe the hazard type and within that, the hazard process. And we're in the process of um, aligning this with the UNDRR hazard information profiles. So trying to bring an, an existing standard to describe the hazard type and process. So you can describe earthquake footprints, whether it's ground motion, liquefaction within the same data set, um, and you can then filter by those, those details as well. Um, and we provide details like units of intensity. Um, I've been looking for flood maps previously and had to dive into the data to figure out whether it's meters, centimeters, or decimeters to, uh, in terms of flood depth. Um, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to open the data set and, and interrogate it to find that basic information. So we've, we've added things like, like that in there so you can immediately see what it's showing. And of course it allows you to, um, to showcase current hazard, hazard data, um, hazard intensity under different climate change scenarios and describe the scenarios that have been used. Further than that, we allow um, or enable you to describe event sets for probabilistic models or single events for, for scenarios. So you can provide a single event or a set of a few events observed or simulated and, and the metadata allows you to describe um, the origin of those, those footprints. Um, and it allows you to describe the occurrence probability, the return period associated with a particular, um, a particular hazard map or a scenario. It also allows you to describe multiple uh, footprints, so you can provide um, lots of uncertainty around the footprint data, provide the range of intensity measures within the same data set. And we allow you to describe um, events, cascading events, so you can provide, or you can identify the event that's triggered another um, and provide linked um, hazard maps that way. Within the exposure data, we support um, existing taxonomies like the Jed for All taxonomy, um, various taxonomies used in the insurance industry. Um, so we're not proposing to describe um, exposure data in a new way, but we link back to these existing existing structures. Um, we support data building footprint to to aggregate um, aggregate data types, and you can describe multiple asset types, lines of business, including population, natural environment, as well as the built infrastructure. Um, within vulnerability data, we classify each curve using the hazard type and the exposure category that have been defined also within the hazard and exposure components. So each component is using the same consistent code lists. Um, so when you're searching for residential uh, buildings, you can pull up the residential exposure data, but also residential um, or vulnerability curves that relate to residential data. Uh, so it's all consistent across each of the components. Um, and it describes in the metadata the impact type, metrics, um, direct, indirect um, impacts, um, calculation methods that, that have been used. Also links out to source data that's been used, um, source information, relevant technical reports, peer-reviewed papers, etc. And then with the lost data, um, we can provide uh, labeling to define whether it's uh, describing direct loss, indirect losses, um, loss or damage to structures, contents, production, um, impact on people, whether it's economic or insured, um, and the quantity, whether it's number of buildings, number of people, or, or length of infrastructure, for example. And again, describe the loss calculation approach um, and the loss data provides an explicit link back to each of the other components. So if you find a, a set of risk estimates described in the risk data library standard, within that metadata you'll find an ID that links back to the exposure data set, the vulnerability data, and the hazard data that have been used to create those risk, inf those risk estimates. So in that way we're providing a, meta a, a complete standard that will allow you to describe a full um, a full package of risk information. So you can describe a single data set or a full package from a risk assessment. 
Um, we just wanted to show you uh, very quickly, so that's the, that's the home page, but what this looks like in practice in a, in a, um, a data catalog. And the standard is set up as a, as a JSON file, so it can be loaded into lots of different data catalogs. Our vision is that this would be used in different data catalogs. And this is our example catalog that um, and we also have data on the World Bank um, data catalog as well using the RDLS. So here we've built a tool that will allow you to filter by, um, by the, the risk data category, so you can immediately filter your lost data from the others. Uh, you can filter by country, the usual filter. Um, geographic scale, hazard type, licenses, um, and things like project name as well. So we've loaded up here lots of data from, a, from an Afghanistan um, risk assessment done in 2018 by GFDRR. It's all uh, openly licensed. And just looking at the exposure data here, we, you can find all of the uh, resources. So lots of TIFF files describing the building's infrastructure, agriculture developed under that exposure data. And some of the categories um, and the dimensions and the quantities that are included in that data set. And then some additional information around, um, around the purpose, who created the data, and again, the license. So with the metadata, we're, we're able to uh, provide this, this filtering. Um, we're uploading more and more data to this, um, this new portal um, so that it becomes the, the home for um, data stored by the Risk Data Library. Um, so yeah, one example. Um, but this, we're working on this being able to be imported to um, not only JCAN but CCAN and, and we can work on importing this to, uh, to other um, types of catalogs as well. So I just want to talk very quickly about some, um, some of our early adopters before we have two of our early adopters in the room um, come up on stage. So um, I've been working with the OASIS loss modeling framework uh, for a number of years. It's a, a modeling framework maintained and built uh, within the insurance industry, increasingly being um, applicable to development sector risk financing and insurance. They've worked hard to develop some open data standards for exposure data and results data, so the losses, um, but they've never worked on describing metadata, so it's a real gap in, in what, uh, how they're providing information. So they've done a study to look at um, how they might use the RDLS, and they've, they've concluded it's very compatible, and, and the, the work that's ongoing this year is to integrate the RDLS into the OASIS ecosystem and provide some online examples of of models um, stored with, uh, with the RDLS information. We also have uh, the European Commission Risk Data Hub managed at the, at the JRC, um, who have integrated the RDLS into their Risk Data Hub platform. Um, so some of their feedback on the left-hand side there, uh, which persuaded them to, to use this um, and implement it, um, actually without support from us, they, they did this um, entirely from the documentation online. So hopefully that shows that that's, that's useful and, and it's, all, uh, it's all very workable. Um, but they were, they were very uh, pleased that it was data tailored for di disaster risk management um, and providing greater interoperability um, and integration of their data that's, that's uh, going on that platform. Um, and then an academic example. We have some of the Tomorrow Cities team in the room. Um, so this is a, a recent conversation and uh, I'm pleased that Tomorrow Cities have decided to start to use the RDLS to describe their data um, from this um, urban disaster risk hub. Uh, so, yeah, an interdisciplinary research hub um, focusing on urban scenarios, future visioning, and impact assessment at the urban scale. And they've been working in nine cities. Um, I think that's, I think I've got that right. Um, so that project's coming to an end, and the team are looking to host the data somewhere and making it accessible. And we're pleased that they're going to start using the RDLS to, um, to share that on their Tomorrow Cities data catalog. So a few early adopters there. We're going to just break to listen to um, a video from Rachel Vint. As I said, she's from Open Data Services. Uh, they really brought the best practice um, from developing lots of different open data standards into this project to make it as useful um, and easy to implement as it is today. So, yeah, we'll play this video. 
Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Vint and I'm a director with Open Data Services. We're a workers cooperative and international experts in data standards. So our core business is researching, building, maintaining and promoting open data standards to solve global challenges. So we've worked with the Risk Data Library team recently to help develop the Risk Data Library data standard within current best practices. And today I'm going to briefly look at why data standards are needed, what they provide, and finally, why you should care about them. So what's wrong with data anyway? Why do we need data standards in the first place? So we all know that working with data can be incredibly messy and time consuming, requiring cleaning and wrangling before being used. Data can always also be really difficult to find. It can be inconsistent. It can be siloed. Um, inoperable and not machine readable, and generally just not helpful sometimes. An example of why data standards are important is to think about all the different ways there are to write the date. So without choosing and agreeing a standard way of representing the date in data, it's really impossible to know whether the date on the slide is the 10th of November 2012, the 11th of October 2012, or the 12th of November 2010. So data standards themselves are the rules that describe how to record and publish data. And they're supported by an ecosystem of software tools, documentation and guidance and communities of practice. Open standards are freely available and developed using collaborative processes. So they function as public goods that anyone can benefit from and that anyone can contribute towards their development. Data standards also help to solve complex real life problems. Problems such as the lack of timely and forward looking humanitarian aid data. And so by using the data standard, which is the International Aid Transparency Initiative, this allows for better decision making and more cooperation so the aid is more effective. Another problem is how to tackle global corporate corruption and financial crime. And again, by using the beneficial ownership data standard, this allows for better corporate transparency and accountability. And finally, what we're here to talk about today with the increasing demand of data for climate adaption and disaster risk reduction, this is helped by the Risk Data Library standard, which makes it easier to find, publish and share the relevant information. So to summarise what an open standard, open data standard is, they lay out how to format and structure the data, but what makes it open is that the data is available publicly, the decision making is open and transparent, and it builds upon and aligns with other standards. And this final point is important to avoid the new data standard pitfall. So this is possibly the best cartoon I've seen about open data standards, or although I'll admit there aren't many. Uh, so for those that can't read the slide, it says the situation, there are 14 competing standards. 14, ridiculous. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. Later, there are 15 competing standards. And that's why the Risk Data Library standard builds upon other established standards such as GED for All, GEM Building Taxonomy, UNDRR, etc. without duplicating what's already been established. So along with not duplicating what's already out there, there are some other best practices in open data standards. These are things like using open formats, having clear documentation, uh, using version control, having machine readable data, working with key stakeholders, linking with other standards, as we've mentioned, uh, building a community around the standard and having transparent governance. There are often also three main components to an open data standard in practice, not including its governance. So these are having schema and code lists. So these are the things that define the structure and format of the data, such as the meaning of each field. You also have documentation, so guidance and reference documentation, so that you know how to publish and use the data. And then you have open source tools. So things like um, tools for converting, validating and exploring the data. And as it is an open data standard, so you can contribute to the ongoing development of it by getting involved, uh, such as uh, through the GitHub, public GitHub repository. And so finally, why should you care? Because when done right, open data standards make everyone's work easier, whether that's analysing or producing risk data. 
The data is then accessible, interoperable and of high value. The data can then be used to make and measure change and as a result the data has real world impact. Thank you. Okay, so if you weren't convinced before, hopefully that explains why we, uh, why we spent so much time working on the risk data library. Um, and some of the, the workflow, the documentation that Rachel showed there, the conversion tool at the end, um, that's all available on the website and, and makes it much easier to create um, the metadata in JSON format. So there's a, a workflow laid out that's all documented in the user guide. Um, Daniela, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, hopefully this will be interesting still. <laughs> but um, I wanted to just share my experience or the experience that my team has had with, um, with the RDLS. Um, just to introduce myself and, and my company, in case you don't know us, I work at Arab, we're a global engineering firm. And we, my team focuses on leveraging our multidisciplinarity to evaluate risks uh, to the built environment and people. And because we are risk practitioners, we are in a data, our day to day job is collecting data, working with data, analyzing data to build risk assessments um, to support our clients in decision making. Um, and so I just wanted to start with a little bit of background. Um, and so I know Stu mentioned the, the status quo right now, which is it's hard to access data. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that for us. This is one of our key pain points. So again, we feel this every day when we try to find data um, and it's really hard. And even when we get data, it's hard to understand and use it. Um, and that has also led us to develop our own tools internally just to try to help us or else ourselves organize. Um, so we have processes, protocols, guidelines, databases that we have worked. Um, so I just want to mention three real quick. The first one is universal taxonomy for risk assessment. So I had a session this morning where we presented this also in collaboration with GFDRR. And again, this is just tying into the theme of why we need to, to at least try to standardize Basic frameworks, again, not to be prescriptive, but just to have a little bit of organization. Um, then we have also developed what we call HAPI, which is our hazard API. Uh, again, trying to facilitate that extraction of hazard data in an automated way. So we built this API that we use ourselves for day-to-day -day work. We connect to data sources from partners that we work with uh, for the data that we develop ourselves. Um, and we have also on, on our own internal library of uh, vulnerability functions, fragility functions. So again, these are all pieces that we have to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and now in terms of our experience, um, so we have seen that metadata is really key. We have seen that if we don't have that, there's a lot of gen regeneration of data and tools that probably already exist somewhere else, but then this needs to just constant mushrooming of new things uh, like the, the cartoon that we saw before. Um, so I just wanted to bring one example that I saw firsthand a couple of years ago. We were working on a project um, with the World Bank. So the World Bank put out this RFP to, do, um, to try to estimate the investment needs on adaptation in Colombia's road network. And of course, to do that, you needed to do a risk assessment. Um, I knew that the country already had done a really good, full detailed probabilistic risk assessment multi-hazard for, uh, for the multi multiple sectors, including roads. And so we went and proposed like, hey, we don't need to develop the model again. Why? We just need the data. If you can get us the data, we can skip that step and focus on the important part, which is the second step of getting to the measures of the adaptation financing, which is what they wanted. Um, and so we were able to do that. It was a, it was a happy case, in case in, because we were able to get the data, but it wasn't as smooth because there wasn't a standard. So we had to ask the World Bank to ask the Ministry of Environment to get the data. I, I drove physically and got, and got it on a hard drive, um, then had to dig into what the data sets were, what it meant, but we were able to use it. So again, that's just one case where it's, it is valuable to have these, um, the data available and usable. Um, the other thing that's key for us is that, is that it has, the RDLS has um, GitHub or like the digital components, uh, which is key for us. So again, we also have our own GitHub repository. So this is just a screenshot from our own. So we have a, a bunch of different repos uh, in GitHub. This is one that we use in our, in our Hazard API and Happy to process Fathom data, which is one of our partners. So again, this is what we do on our daily uh, jobs. And so if I have this access or functionality to use GitHub, it's just perfect for us as well. Um, 
And then lastly, I just wanted to share uh, three uh, instances where we tried it out, we tested it out to see how valuable it is. Um, so first, uh, which is what I'm showing here, we're working on a project uh, in Madagascar, also with the World Bank, to do multi-hazard risk assessment for the transportation um, sector in the country. Um, and so I tested it out because we have the results now. So we have, I use the risk result or the risk shape file. And there's a, what you see kind of on the top screen is you have a, a template that's a spreadsheet. And so you start filling out the fields, which are you know, intuitive for if, if you work with this data, it's easy for us to fill out. Like Stu was saying, it's fields that we already know and use. Uh, but then when you use the tools that are online, you can convert that spreadsheet into the JSON file, which is what creates the metadata. And so it was a really simple process to use um, and follow, and that just, again, leverages. The example that I used it is on, um, on the shape file of the airports that we assessed. Um, and so that would just really enable the delivery of the results. The second case that I tried is, um, so we had a project that we concluded um, before uh, for the Cook Islands with the Asian Development Bank. And we had a, de a deliverable, which is again the GIS files. So before we had this, we just delivered it in the standard, let's say ISO standards, GIS standards, all good. But then I said, what if I just test this retroactively? So I took one of our files as an example, again, um, just the rest result file. Because I already had that, I simply exported the JSON file. I used the online tool converter to uh, to change it back to the spreadsheet so I could complete the fields and then re-export it with the completed fields, um, and that worked. One thing that I wanted to point out that is really helpful is that when you, you use the tool, it gives you flags like that error, and that's really good because it lets you know what you're missing. So it's like, me, hey, you forgot to fill out this field, which is critical. So I go back, I fill it, and then I update it. Um, so just because I was trying to, uh, to use it different, um, in different ways. And the last way I tested it was not on a risk um, layer or data set, but on a resource, which is something that I found really useful. So if you go into the, into the tools and the worksheets, you see that, yes, you can use it for risk, you know, hazard data, exposure vulnerability risk data, but also for just general resources. So I use the taxonomy that we published, which is a PDF report, but it's a useful resource, resource that you could cite or use in any of my projects, and there's uh, another tab that allows you to do that. So again, it's the same process, the same thing, easy export, it flags any errors that you might have made in the process, and that way, because you have the unique ID, you can then package it together, this is my one project, I have all of these layers, I have this resource that I used, which is not a GIS file, but it's, it's just a report that is, that's still usable. Um, so with that, um, I think that's it, what I had in terms of my experience. Oh yeah, that's just that Jason that resulted from that. Um, but to conclude, I just wanted to share a little bit of why, as from the practitioner's point of view, this is really useful and I think would facilitate our lives internally and then externally delivering, working, receiving data from others as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pradeep Mandapaka from uh, JBA Risk Management. Uh, we at uh, JBA Risk Management, uh, we are a team of uh, scientists, engineers, and mathematicians, and we develop this uh, high-resolution flood mapping and flood modeling uh, for at a global scale to be mainly used by insurance and uh, reinsurance and banking sectors. In addition to catering to these sectors, we also, we also uh, work closely with uh, international financial institutions, government agencies, and, uh, and humanitarian agencies for uh, flood risk assessment projects, as well as uh, disaster risk financing and uh, disaster risk reduction projects. And in these projects, we use sometimes our own data sets, but we also develop custom hazard and uh, uh, probabilistic models uh, to serve these uh, projects. So in order to have, in order to maintain these projects, we need like a standard uh, metadata standard. So we are uh, an early adapter for uh, RDLS because we saw great value in uh, using this standard for uh, a variety of data sets that we developed as part of this uh, uh, international uh, development uh, projects. 
So today I'm going to share uh, our experience generating the metadata, metadata workflow uh, following the Risk Data Library uh, online converter tool. We used uh, this uh, workflow generation for uh, two of our uh, recently finished uh, projects and where we developed a hazard and a climate change event sets. We populated the spreadsheets, uh, spreadsheet templates and we uploaded the data into the online converter to, con to obtain the, the JSON file. We, uh, the feedback is that the workflow, the in general, uh, in terms of populating the Excel files, it's uh, very simple and understandable, and the templates are quite useful, and there is uh, a lot of supporting information that is available online, and the validation feature which is uh, present in the, in the online converter tool is uh, quite helpful. As uh, Daniela just demonstrated, it throws very helpful error messages, and we are actually applying this to all our new data sets that we are going to develop in our ongoing projects as well as uh, upcoming projects. And we also saw great value in this uh, RDLS that we are trying to implement it internally to version control our own data sets as well as uh, uh, version control our documentation for the data. So I'm going to stop here now and thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a few more details on, on some of the use cases that have, have, uh, have come about from the RDLS. So, yeah, we're excited to, to see some traction and people took, uh, taking up the RDLS and starting to use it. Um, it's an ongoing project, we're learning, um, and every time somebody uses it, there's some feedback. Um, we're already working on the next version. Um, we do really want everybody to get involved and provide feedback via the GitHub and help improve it as a community. Um, it's, yeah, it's something that will improve over time and will become more useful as more people use it. So hopefully that's given a, a window into some of the capabilities, some of the examples of how it's been used. And we'll use the last, um, we've got 20 minutes left, so we'll use the last 24 questions um, and take any yeah, any questions, a bit of discussion. Um, so, yeah, please come up to the, the stalls. And while we discuss, we'll also leave this information on the, on the screen so you can access all the documentation, um, examples, workflow from the riskdatalibrary.org um, and directly at the, the RDLS standard. And for any support, you can contact, um, use the email at the bottom there. Okay, can I open it up to any questions from the audience? I, I can feel a low energy, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we, we can manage to <laughs> finish that there with a, yeah, please. Can I start? Um, it's Ikoyasi from uh, Brandon University, Canada. Basically, the things are a little bit over my head, to be honest. It's a little bit too te technical, but the, my question is the, from the social vulnerability point of view. The challenge for, for us is the having updated uh, data, the, even just the census data. They, uh, they update almost literally every day, right? So I wonder how you can make your data current and accurate, like a just constantly I have to check back again and again? Or is there any way that uh, you can achieve that? Um, so the data would be stored with the risk data library when it's created as part of a project, a risk assessment or, or other project. Um, and all of the sources for, for that uh, data set would be stored within the metadata. There'd be a, a version or a year clearly identified in the metadata. So if somebody came to that, they could see that it was created in 2021, say, um, look at the data that, that contributed and see whether that was up to date or not. 
and then take a decision to use it directly or build on it or start from scratch. Um, so we wouldn't be updating the data outside of the projects, but we'd be able to store all the information for you to make that decision. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, thank you for this presentation uh, and for this effort. I think um, yeah, it's very good to, to make data more accessible. Do I have a question? Um, in disasters management, to do uh, inclusive decision making, um, we need more disaggregated data. Uh, we also know that in a lot of data, there's a lot of bias. Um, what are you doing to, like, it, I think it's very good to make data, for example, uh, machine readable. But we also know that making data machine readable uh, will um, often even establish, or how do you say it, um, um, make the, the bias uh, even bigger. Because people will say, well, you know, we, we've did uh, machine learning on it, and it proves that this is true. But the data that went into it was already not inclusive and was not biased. Um, so aren't you afraid that this might propagate um, the bias in data and, and hamper uh, inclusive decision making? And what are you doing to counteract it? Mm -hmm. Can I take that one? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. So we, you know, we, we used to say um, garbage in, garbage out, right? So the, um, I think we are talking about a kind of a value chain of or like a, a process with different elements, different steps, different people who are going to to um, work on the on the information and are going to pass that to each other. Uh, I think what is helpful with having a standard is that upfront you can already establish kind of a, a baseline of a framework of the type of data that you want to uh, uh, collect. And, and you know that that framework you can, uh, you will use it and you know that other colleagues uh, or other partners will, will use the same. So that's already a baseline of, okay, we agree that for instance, and we included socioeconomic indicators in the standard that uh, having uh, disaggregated uh, gender information is important for vulnerability purposes, right? And, and that's why also it's important to have um, open processes on, and discussion on what is important actually. And so the, the fact that we now include gender information has been, ba has been based on an open process. And like the, the UR community, you know, we had discussion about that. And based on this conversation, it's now translated into uh, standards and then tools. And, there, and I know, I mean, a standard is not sexy, huh? but uh, uh, in the end, it's really um, support all the tools and the systems that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yes, and I, um, I think it's a, a good answer, uh, but I think it only covers a part. Um, because it's, for example, um, a lot of lost data, for example, is uh, not, uh, not gender-disaggregated uh, yet. Right, which means that we don't know if gender plays a role in, in uh, being more affected, or we, we do, from the little that is disaggregated. Uh, and I think if you don't disaggregate that data, you're also gonna find risk reduction measures that are not the most effective to actually target that, uh, that disbalance. So uh, yes, it's important to include gender information, but we also need to, as a DRM community, become better at collecting disaggregated data and not just on the socioeconomics or on the, the vulnerability side, but also on who's more impacted. Uh, and it's not just gender, it's also disabled people, it's also uh, et uh, ethnicity uh, background. Uh, and I think, uh, the, the, the danger is, and that's it's, and I'm not against anything that you said, and I, and I know it starts with opening up data, and I'm, so I'm not saying that this isn't a step in the right direction, but I think it starts with um, being more aware of these things, and the danger of 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 making this sort of biased data sets more accessible is that we then are going to do uh, analysis and say, see, there is no. Um, um, bigger impact on, for example, women than men by disasters, why we do know they are, but, but then the, the data um, doesn't show it because it's not disaggregated. So I think we need to 
besides the standards, also maybe adopt standards on how, what type of data we collect, how. Um, yeah, yeah I totally agree. But look, um, like for instance on gender, is it about, uh, the question is it about us uh, being responsible uh, to include gender data into disaster risk management, or is it about the question on having uh, gender data in census, for instance? And, and so then you're starting also to, uh, to look at who is responsible for what, and so we, we can solve all the problems, but at least we uh, are trying to uh, uh, support tools uh, in an open manner that can help uh, to uh, address those problems. That, that's a risk, I agree, that's a risk, yeah, yeah. I think this is a, an example of, of something we don't flag easily within the data sets and within the metadata. And things like this, we can think about adding a flag to say this is gender disaggregated or a filter at least so people can see how many, see the proportion of data sets that are and aren't and um, just raise a bit of, yeah, make it more visible at least. Any questions? Yes, Carol. Yeah. So I, have, I have a simple question. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it's a great initiative. Um, and so you get access to uh, many data sets. And when it will be very successful, there will be similar data sets of the same kind in the database, I would assume. So. Um, and I can imagine that it's not your objective then to say, well, this is better than the other. So how, how are we going to, to do that? Because, like I said, great initiative, and if it's successful, we have to make choices later on what to use. So you, you probably thought about it. Uh. The, the question has come up before, yeah. And um, yeah, rating the quality of data sets isn't, isn't within the scope of creating no. a standard. No. Um, I think the, the decision on quality has to come down to the risk analysts. Um, what we're trying to do is open up the information so they can make that decision on the basis of seeing the data record in the catalog and hopefully they can filter and make that, make that or get closer to that decision before having to open up every data set and interrogate it. I don't know, Daniela and Pradeep, you maybe want to come in. Yeah, I think uh, this morning session by uh, where Daniela presented a taxonomy of uh, risk assessment data sets where each uh, data set can be associated with a particular flag or a level. So that would that could help in deciding which data set can be used for a particular purpose. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's of course your, me as a practitioner, I have to decide. It, it's, um, um, I think it's, it's um, this is kind of the risk. So if I, for example, would upload the data set, then uh, you don't know exactly what the quality is. Nobody knows exactly. So sort of that, yeah, we need to sort of share that information, what is, what is good to use or what not. But, but again, that's, that's a secondary problem. I think but this is already a great uh, initiative. But it's kind of the same question as for uh, like a market, you know? Yeah. A market, you need a, for a market to function, you need uh, transparency. And so it's all about uh, yeah. having transparency in the, what people are providing. And so yeah. we, don't, we don't want to, to stop competitions, no. uh, of course. No, no, no we, we want to promote innovation. We want to promote uh, the fact that people will be able to share what they have done and yeah. explain how they have done it. And, uh, and then we'll be able to, to compare and to, to select. Yeah. yeah, perfect, thanks. Um, it's also worth mentioning we're not trying to host lots of data in one place. Um, so we're not inviting lots of upload of data. So on the World Bank data catalog, it would be um, data that's been signed off in the normal way through a World Bank project and deemed uh, quality enough to finish the project and sign off that project. The same thing with data in, in Arup goes through the QA and JBA and I'm sure at DHV as well. So. Um, in a way, it's, it's dodging the question a little bit, but in a way, the data that goes onto a company or organization's website or data catalog, it's, it becomes their responsibility to have signed that off and make sure it's good quality. Um, yeah, and hopefully they're using the risk data library so we can search all of those different catalogs in the end.
And maybe can I just add one thing? Because when we were looking at this, we were also trying to understand. So one thing is the standard, and another one is the library. So I could also use the standard for just internal purposes and not publish if I can't, because it's, it's, um, I'm, I have an NDA, it's confidential information, I have to publish, but I can still use it to organize my data sets and everything that I need to do. So I think yeah, if you decouple the two, then there's two different uses. Yeah, <clears throat> just have a question exactly on the balance between you know with the standards or the data schema. We were discussing this today and uh, the metadata uh, part, which I think I mean is the new philosophical trend that we are proposing to go a little bit more into the metadata part and a little bit less I mean, into the data schema. So I would like to to understand. Uh, from your point of view is that uh, there's going to be like a still like a hybrid I mean approach I mean for the future do you think that we will abandon a bit the data schema which would be a pity I mean for me and uh, go just for the metadata part because you think I mean it's more effective uh, I don't know just I mean what, what do you think is going to happen I mean uh, we yeah we can see that you were part of the, the yeah. history of, of the, the old of school. The, yeah. Part, yeah. Um, <laughs> so just uh, on, on that, I mean, uh, I, I don't think there is any difference between the a standard and a schema. I mean, the, the, uh, a schema becomes a standard when it is used by different people, right? I, I think the, 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 maybe the shift that we have done is that uh, we really want uh, different organizations to, uh, we, we don't want to centralize everything. That's really not the, the vision. We want people to use uh, our tools, our standards, for their own purposes. And then, if they share, that's great. If they don't want to share for some, some reasons, and that's also great, because they, they are using tools that are compatible with uh, others. So, so that's the vision. But of course, to achieve that vision, you also need some uh, uh, key players, uh, champions. And we. Oh, I mean, the bank, of course, is going to play that role. Uh, we already have made, the, you know, all risk information managed by the bank, collected by the bank, will be compliant with the standard. But we need also other adopters to, to show that it's useful and to create, again, that, that net network effect. No, Pierre, yeah, if I can just add on that. Um, maybe I didn't explain myself, I mean, quite a bit. So the standard, I mean, it's okay. But, I mean, I understood you want to go more on the metadata component board and into the data schema itself, so not transforming the data, but I mean invest a little bit more in the metadata description, okay, in a sense. If, is that true or, I mean, are we still aiming at having, I mean, the standard, I mean, on, in front? Yeah, so the, we have a focus on the metadata part, but we are still, so the a standard, you can standardize everything, <laughs> right? You can standardize your content, you can standardize the way you describe your content, right? So uh, uh, we have a, a standard for the metadata, but for some parts you also have a standard for the content. The, the thing is, for instance, for the exposure, we already have a lot of standards for the content. We have GEM, we have uh, uh, jet for all and so on. So there is no reason for us to create another one, uh, as, as we saw uh, with the Russian examples. So that's also the work we have been doing. Where we, do, we need standardization, where, where there is a gap in terms of uh, we don't have that uh, common vocabulary. So just some background to where the Risk Data Library standard started. It, it was started with some um, funding from UK DFID, now FCDO, to address um, problems in, in data access. So we had three challenge funds, and we created a database schema for exposure data, which is jed for all uh, for vulnerability curves, which is called Mover, and was developed by uh, UCL. Uh, GEM led the development of, of jed for all um, And we also developed a, a hazard data base. Um, and Mover is still being used um, by UCL, and jed for all is still being used, I believe, by um, Shima as well as by GEM. So these, these do exist, and they provide structures for the data. I think um, we realized at some point that, that to drive adoption, the metadata was the, the thing that people can pick up and describe their data and allow people to access it more easily without shifting their workflows to a whole new data standard. For example, Oasis, I, I showed the Oasis example earlier. They have defined their op open exposure data standard um, but we want to be able to apply the metadata on top of that to make it more powerful together. 
So that was, that was what the shift is. But the, the, um, the database schema do still exist, um, but our focus is on, on the metadata at the moment. Any other questions? We are going quite technical, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've got a, a few minutes left before yeah. half past six. We won't keep you beyond half six, obviously. Any other, any other questions? No? Well, I think, can we wrap up? Um, I'd like to just ask Daniela and Pradeep, um, from your use of the data, what, what have you found most valuable in being able to pick up this data standard and um, use it, get to grips with it, uh, decide that it's valuable enough to continue and persevere with? So I think there's two things. The first thing that I loved were the error screens, because <laughs> that's just easy to identify. Um, but then the second is that it may seem silly, because we, if we work on this every day, we know that, yes, I need to know what the unit is, feet or meters. But if it's not there, it, it's just a headache. And so what I would, like we would do before is, you have your files, you hand them over, and then have a, like a readme text file saying, this layer is this, this layer is this. Um, this is the unit, this is my assumption. So just finding that or having that in one unique place that it's tied together, all my data sets as a package, I think that's what makes it easier. And again, it's nothing, right, it's nothing new that we hadn't, that we're discovering something new. It's just like, I mean, yes, why, why didn't we think of this before? <laughs> it's as simple as adding one field. What's your unit? What's your return period? Is it PGA? Is it, what is it? Um, because it's, it's the information that we already do. Uh, and use. Um, so I think it's done. It's just that it's simple and it fits in with what we're already doing. Yeah, just to add to it, also in terms of uh, JSON file creation, one can create JSON file, uh, but to create it uh, from spreadsheet, it's really, we found it very helpful because spreadsheets are something very, we are very familiar with. So we can just populate the spreadsheets easily and use the online converter to convert the spreadsheets into, into the JSON files. And in the process, the validation feature is also very uh, helpful with all its uh, error messages and uh, also the documentation, the wealth of documentation that is available online. Uh, although it did take us a bit of time to go through all that document, uh, all that uh, information, but it was not a very not a very steep learning curve. It was quite, uh, we, we see great value in uh, using uh, RDLS uh, even internally within JBA. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I've had conversations today about the RDL and um, one thing that came up was having some example spreadsheets would help people get to grips with using it and how to fill it out. So there are things we can still improve that we've not, we've not thought of yet, we've not done yet. Um, so we are still looking for feedback to improve this. I think every time there's a, there's a project or a question, there's, there's maybe a tweak to some code lists or a, an extra object or field that we, we could consider adding or um, a use case that, that maybe isn't quite completely, um, completely dealt with. So we are very open to any feedback um, via the GitHub, via the email. Um, we are actively developing the next version of it. So we would welcome you having a look at the website, having a look at the documentation, giving it a try, and let us know how you get on. Um, and hopefully we can build a bit more traction and uh, have more and more data sets on these catalogs and, and a more effective um, sharing of risk data overall. Um, Pierre, do you want to say anything to finish up? Um, thank you uh, for, for coming, for your uh, interest. Um, I was. Just thinking, you know, I mean, we are talking about uh, data standards and we are here in Japan and for many of us, you know, it's a completely different language, different alphabet. And, but still, we are talking together about, uh, you know, uh, disaster risk and disaster risk management. So it, just to, to say that we, we need those common structure for us to uh, be able to exchange, to exchange, to communicate and not to exchange data. And, and so I, I feel, okay, maybe it's, it's not the, the the most sexiest thing, but uh, I, I believe um, sometimes uh, the less 
um, sexier things are maybe the most important when we are talking about uh, resilience. And I do believe data standards are, are important. So thanks again, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, keep in touch. Okay, thank you. Have a good evening, thinking about metadata standards, I'm sure.